So what do I have to do? I have to... Oh, this is the pointer. Okay. Okay. And for this to work, we are waiting for the room to be filled. Estamos esperando que la sala está llena para empezar. No, porque no funciona el micro. Bueno, quizá, quizá no. Hi, there are some free space in the front row. <laughs> so hello everyone. Please take a seat if you can find one. Told you. <laughs> There's no more space. Okay, we're gonna start now, please. So, welcome to this session, which is a, a joint session. So, it's my pleasure to chair this session today. It's a joint session between data and systems. So, we will have one highlight talk from data and two proceeding talks from systems. So, my name is Anais Bodo. I'm very pleased to chair this session today. Uh, the main topic will be computational biomedicine. And we will hear first about a registry to enhance access to AR models from uh, David Blumenthal. Then we will hear about multiomics network integration for drug, respo drug response prediction by uh, Katharina Blaum. And finally, we will have graph neural networks uh, to uh, detect subnetworks from Bastian uh, Pfizer. So please, um, David, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Many people, great, at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, um, yeah, I will, I will present our, our registry for AI in, uh, in biomedical research. And before um, really getting into the details, um, let's tell me why we did this. So here's a situation you can prob probably, maybe not all, but most of you can probably relate to. So you might see a nice, a nice new AI paper which you find interesting, and then you're like, yeah, let's try this out. We have our own problem where we, where we might apply it, or we have our own method against which we would like to compare this, this, existing, this existing approach, and then you start. And um, if you're lucky, you find a GitHub repository, but um, then maybe only, only half of the code is there, and um, you don't have code to pre-process the data, or, or the data is not there at all, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, we are facing this problem all of the, ti all of the time, probably like you, and so we thought, okay, let's, let's try to, instead of only um, sort of complaining, let's try to do something um, to improve the situation. This is, how, this is how Amy was born, or how we, st how we started thinking about, about Amy. Um, so what I will do today, I will, first, I will first tell you a bit about the status quo of Amy, and then I will, um, I will present some plans for the future, and um, there would, it would be great if uh, we could, I could also collect some feedback, so I think I might have some more time for questions than these five minutes. All right, all right, so let's go. Um, first of all, I would like to um, introduce all the, te the, the entire team behind, behind Amy. So this is this long list of author, authors of the original paper, and it has grown since then. So um, like two or three months ago, Hector um, also has joined our team, and we are open to anybody who wants to contribute. All right, so this is like the distribution. So we have, um, so of, this, of the steering, we call it steering committee, the team behind, behind Amy. Um, so we are, we are researchers from essentially all over, all over the world, well, mainly, mainly Europe, but, uh, but not only. And as I just said, you may, you may join us if you want to. All right, so the first question which we had to face when designing Amy was whether we want to have it normative or descriptive, right? So what's the difference? Um, if you have, if you have normative, uh, normative um, guidelines for eye medicine, in biomedicine, then you would ask researchers to do things in a specific way, yeah? tell them what they should do. And there are actually many guidelines, normative guidelines in the sense around, and um, 
you know, one of them is um, the, the, uh, the dome, the dome recommendations from the Alexia, from, from Alexia, which um, you might you might be familiar with. Um, so with that, I thought, okay, I mean, this actually already exists, um, but it sort of has the pro these normative guidelines sort of have the problem have the problem that I mean, well, of course, we all know how we should do it. The problem is that many people just don't do it like this. So with, with, we said, okay, instead of telling people what to do, we ask them what they did. And that's the, so that's sort of the approach behind, behind Amy. So it's descriptive, it's essentially a questionnaire. And um, yeah, we ask the authors of biomedical AI systems what they in fact, uh, what they in fact did. And so the idea is that if, you, if we have at least, um, in, we, have a, we, have a, we have a report where people say, look, okay, data isn't available because, uh, well, I couldn't provide it due to some problems, whatever, then at least we know this, it's transparent, and um, we, might, we might proceed accordingly. Maybe you say, okay, we don't really fully trust this model, or we say, yeah, let's contact the authors, at least we, we, have, it, we have it written somewhere. And um, also the same, with, uh, the same with biases, so we have a section in, in Amy where we, where we ask about possible biases and whether the authors of the AI models checked for them. And also here, um, it's good to, I mean, maybe they didn't, but then it's good to know that they didn't, right? Or maybe, or maybe they did and they don't, didn't report in the paper because they only had seven pages in bioinformatics. Yeah? Um, so you, you never know the reason why some things are missing which you would like to see. And the idea was to, to sort of provide a way to, to, for the authors to provide this in a structured way. All right, um, so here's, here's an overview of the entire thing. Um, so Amy has, has several components, and um, well, the core is sort of um, this this database here. So it's a web it's a web service. I will show you some screenshots in the following slides. It has a database where um, reports are stored. Then, um, as a user, you can you can create you can create a new report, and those reports they implement the current Amy standard, and the Amy standard is essentially just a list of um, a list of uh, or a structured list of questions. Um, yeah. So uh, then we have then we have the steering committee, which is responsible for updating this uh, this AMI standard. Because of course, I mean, AI in biomedicine is an evolving field, so you can't just publish a standard once and then say, okay, now this is valid for all times. Um, so the idea is to really have like an, an an ongoing discussion with the with the community and then update the standard. All right. Um, so. I will give you a very quick overview of what's already contained in the standard, but I won't go into the details. If you want to go, um, if you want to look at them, just visit our visit our web page and have a look at it there. Um, so essentially, we, um, our questionnaire is divided into into five different sections. Um, the first is the first is metadata. Um, so we ask them just to provide their names, email addresses, and and so on and so forth. Um, then we ask the authors to, to tell us uh, what, what was actually the purpose of their, um, of their AI model. Also, this is some, often sometimes, um, well, sometimes something which we, you don't immediately see. I mean, you have a paper and often you don't have, if you don't have a lot of space, um, you, sort of, um, you sort of assume that your readers are familiar with the, with the topic. So really introducing it in a clear way is, I think, something which would, which would also help um, many people who are a bit outside, but still what you understand what you, what you did. Um, then, of course, we ask the authors where the, where the data is. Um, actually, we do this separately for each, for each data set, whether it's accessible, if so, how um, it can be accessed. Um, we ask details about, about the method um, and about reproducibility, so whether the authors provide code to, um, well, first to, to, for, for the method itself, then if it's if it's any learned if it's if it any method if it's any method that learns well maybe not only the trained model but also for training and so on. All right, so this is the this is like the, the, the structure of our of our standard, and then based on the questions you provide, we we um, compute um, uh, reproducibility scores and validation scores. So for example, if you if you um, we have the we have the question, did you check did you check for biases? And if you if you answer if you answer um, no, I didn't, then this has a negative impact on your on your validation score. Um, and actually, I mean, we, we, when, we, when we thought about this initially, we were like, yeah, but everybody just is going to have like um, 10, so it goes from 0 to 10, it's going to have 10 reproducibility score, or validation score, if you, if you provide this, these answers at all. But it's not like this. So also for our stuff, there are, there are always things which you just cannot provide for some, for some reason. All right, so here's how, how it looks like. So you go on the web page, you click on create new report, and then, um, yeah, you, 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 have, you see this questionnaire, and once you have filled it in, um, it creates an, next, an entry in our database, uh, which has a unique URL, and um, 
you can also specify whether you want it so our database is searchable and um, you can you, we have a keyword search and so on implemented and you if you when you create your, your new report you can decide whether you want your paper to be findable by for example keyword search so excluding it from that you will always it will always become findable after I think two or three months unless you say no I need more time um, keeping it um, non-findable at the mo at the beginning might be useful if you have your paper under review and uh, you'd, I mean the UR via the URL the reviewers can then access it but the general public maybe not yet until it is it is published all right so then here's our our database where you can do where you can do a keyword search so now one one question we had to face is what do we do with uh, somehow with answers that are uninformative right we ask the authors where they have their data and then maybe they provide i mean maybe they, they just answer something which doesn't really help they just point us to yeah we got it we, they, they just write okay we got we got our data from tcga and that's it yeah so that's not a very informative answer and um so our idea to, to, somehow, to somehow mitigate this was to build in a lightweight reviewing process into, into Amy. So this is how our reviews look like, or sorry, or sorry our reports look like in the, in the database. And if you think that uh, one of the answers is uninformative, you can raise an issue. So what this means is you just, say, you just write, um, so here's what it looks like, you have to provide your name and your email address, and then you essentially provide a mini review um, of um, this answer which, which was provided here, which is then appended to this, to this report and the authors can of course um, reply to it and then also the reply is appended to the report and like this you have an ongoing, this, you have a discussion um, about the report ongoing. All right, so that's what Amy is at the moment and uh, now I will present some, some plans for the future. Um, so, so first of all, um, again, I invite you to all to all contribute to the new to the new version, and um, you can provide feedback. Either we have actually a dedicated uh, a dedicated contribute section on our on our web page where you can do that. You can also email me or email to the info at Amy um, email address, or you can talk to me. All right. So here are our plans. What we want to what we want to do. So at the moment, um, Amy is pretty general purpose. Um, so we have these, these five blocks which are probably applied to most um, AI models in, in biomedical research. What we want to do now is we want to, we want to provide some optional domain-specific sections which can then be either selected or unselected. And of course, if you select them, this, this shows up in the reports and for some of those sections. So now we, we have implemented two, one concerning privacy, one concerning epistasis, simply because we work a bit on epistasis. And um, so for, for the privacy, for the privacy um, module, um, this will also then generate um, a score, a privacy score, right? Depend, again, depending on your answers. And um, yeah, so any suggestion for further modules are very welcome. So it can be also very specific for a specific domain since it's optional, right? Um, the, the, the users don't have to, don't have to um, answer to all, of your, to all of your questions there. All right, so the, the development version is also online and um, you, you, can, you can access it here under this, under this URL. So I sent you the same one, but with dev in front of the Amy. Very good. So now there's one main problem and with this is actually also the main reason why I wanted to give a talk here and it's cool that it got accepted as a highlight talk. We need to, Amy is ultimately only useful if it's used, right? Um, but at the moment it's not really used. So, um, I mean, we use it, the, but then some, some people we know use it, and yeah, that's it, more or less, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we need, to, we, need to, we need to improve this, right? Otherwise, it's, it's okay, we have a nice, a nice Nitro Methods paper, but it's, it's a bit pointless with respect to what we really wanted to, wanted to achieve. Um, so... That's the main thing, and of course, yeah, I mean, now we have many people in the room, so if any of you would say, okay, let's, let's, let's use it, um, that, would be very, that would be very cool. It's actually, I mean, if you think about it, we thought about why, well, why should people actually use, why should you use it, right, as an author? What's the incentive for doing, for doing so? And then, of course, I mean, there are, in, in principle, you, have, there might, you might have, you might have intrinsic, intrinsic motivation to do this because you want to do things the right way. You want to provide information about your, about your, about your method. Um, uh, you want to make your research transparent and reproducible. Um, and maybe, well, also maybe to a lesser extent, maybe you want to save some space in the main paper um, because these, these um, well, a bit boring details 
well, sometimes they just still take a lot of space and yeah, you can provide them here. But all of these things, in a way, I think it's, it's mainly, it mainly refers to people who do it the right way anyways, right? So we would also write a good method section um, where um, all of this or a lot of this information is actually available. So that's not the people who are intrinsically motivated to fill our Amy reports in a way are not the people we are targeting, right? Not the, it's not the, the, the authors of the real problematic papers where you say, okay, yeah, I really don't know what's, what's, what, what, what's going on in detail. And the question is how to, how to, how to access, how, how to access those, those authors, right? And I, we somehow start having the expression, the impression that for that we might need um, extrinsic motivation. And this is, of course, I mean, you can think of two things. So it might, might simply be required by, um, either by, by funders or by journals to fill in something like, I mean, it doesn't have to be Amy, right? It can be any, 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 any structured report where you provide some technical details of your, of your methods, and that's yeah something we would uh, we would have we would we have to we have to get into that in the next in the next month, and with this I actually want to close and uh, take your questions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Uh, I wonder if it's possible to actually go a bit further and, and try to predict this kind of reproducibility and validity scores for the, for the papers based on back of words or maybe like other AI methods when you have a, a bigger corpus of, of entries in the database. So you would you would say okay we have a we we take the we take the paper itself then run some NLP on it and predict the um, reproducibility or validity score. Yes. Um, yeah. Why, why not? But um, <laughs> so in a way we don't want to we don't want to address any we don't want to introduce any additional AI on top of the AI. That was at least not the it was not the idea. It might be an interesting research project, but I think it's it's a bit separate of of our of our intention. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I do have one. With the scoring system, don't you think that people, authors, would be afraid to have a bad score and to not report um, everything? Yes, and that's actually, so we thought, we thought about this as well. It's, it's a, in a way, it's a trade-off, because on the one hand, um, we, want, we don't want authors to be, uh, to be afraid. On the other hand, we want the reports to be useful. So if just anybody can, um, um, can fill it in in any way, and all reports filled in in any way look the same, um, then, yeah, what's, what's the point, in a way? So we, we tried to balance between this. Also, we initially thought, okay, we make some re replies mandatory, such that if you don't, for example, if you don't provide the code to your method, you simply cannot fill in this, uh, the, this, this, uh, this report. Um, but then, we, then again, we thought, okay, but then maybe, or especially for data, we might lose people who simply cannot share their data um, because they got it from a hospital and the guys in the hospital say, I mean, either because of data privacy or because the guys there simply say, no, you don't publish my data. I mean, this happens, right? Um, so th this was our way to sort, sort of trade off between these two, these two um, extremes, let's say it like this. Okay. I think it's okay. It's uh, just in time. So thank you again. And now we do have multiomics uh, network integration with Katarina Blanc. So first of all, a disclaimer, the tool is not on Amy yet, maybe, <laughs> maybe later. Got to talk, David. All right, so welcome, everyone. My name is Katarina Baum, and I would like to present you um, a method that we developed together with Paulina Hiot, who is also in the audience over there. And it's called Dr. Diamond. It's about explainable drug response prediction from differential analysis of multiomics networks. We are both at Hasso Plattner Institute from Potsdam, close to Berlin, and this is our problem we wanted to tackle. So cancer is a very complex disease, and probably you've heard of the hallmarks of cancer, and they give rise to different processes that are altered and changed in the cancerous cells. Now a cell, again, is a complex element of our body as well. It contains different omics data, metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, genomics, phosphoproteomics, or post translational modifications, and all this complexity is, of course, implicated in these different processes that are altered in cancer, the different hallmarks. And this complexity needs to be analyzed in a multi-layered fashion. So all the different omic layers are connected within and also connected between the layers. And this is something we wanted to exploit with this tool. So the idea is, what is Dr. Diamond doing? So we have multi-omics data of two different conditions or patient groups, A and B, several different layers. And what we want to have is a differential prediction. What is different between those two patient groups? For example, if you want to predict how is the drug response differential between those. And this is what Dr. Diamond is doing. So it's mediating from your input to getting differential predictions. And if you unleash this gray box, we see that it's not a black box, but it's, um, it's an explicit method, method, let's say. And at the heart of Dr. Diamond, there's this integrated molecular network generation. So what we do is we use the multi-omics data to generate networks that capture all the different multi-omics information from the different patient groups compare these two networks into a differential network and use the differential network to derive predictions on drug response. Let me show you some more details on how we generate these networks. So first of all, we go for the single omic layers. So for each patient group, we, for each of the multi-omic layers we have, we would generate a single layer network. 
We use here correlation-based approaches, but of course we can extend that. A correlation-based network would be quite big, so we reduce it a bit upon um, scale freeness assumptions or using a certain density that you want in your network. Now we connect the single layer networks. And for that we use prior information. So we use the, the dogma of molecular biology that an mRNA is giving rise to a protein, so we connect each mRNA to its protein with an edge of weight one. In addition, we connect each protein to its phosphocytes with, an, with edges of weight, weight one as well. And you can have multiple phosphocytes for a single protein, of course. Now, the metabolite layer is a bit more complex because it's not gene-driven, so you do not have this explicit connection. And for that, we use information from databases, such as Stitch, where you have information on how proteins and metabolites interact and regulate one another. So you can have inhibiting regulations and activating regulations, and we also take this into account. And we use the confidence that is also reported in this database to put the edge weight. So we would have values between 0.8 and 1 and minus 0.8 and minus 1. Um, now, this is an integrated network for a patient group, but what we do also is we do a little denoising. So what we do is we replace the edge weights by computing strengths of alternative paths, com comparing or connecting these two nodes that are, that are representative for the edge. We do this until um, path length of length three, because otherwise it's computationally too, co too complex. And like that, we introduce local, or we merge the local information around a node to, to be um, fetched within the edge weight. So it's an integrated interaction score that we use there instead. I brought you a case study. So we use Dr. Diamond on a case study of estrogen receptor stratified breast cancer patients with different data layers. So we have transcriptomic data from TCGA, RNA-seq, um, proteomics and phosphoproteic, proteomics from a different consortium, but also TCGA patients, and also metabolomics data from different studies, but let's disregard them for now. What we do is we generate for the ER negative, oh, ER is the estrogen receptor, it's very important because it's highly prognostic, uh, estrogen receptor negative patients having a worse prognosis usually than estrogen receptor positive patients. So it's a relevant code and also the data is usually there. So the estrogen receptor status is reported in the data sets. We generate for each of these subgroups our integrated networks. Here are the sizes, so it's 12,000 nodes, 60,000 edges here, a bit more edges, but similar number of nodes. And we generate the differential network. To give you a bit of a feeling of how this differential network is looking, I brought you a characterization. So I showed it here in a linear format, but it's again this T-shaped where the protein layer is really central in the middle. So what I brought you here is each dot is one edge of the differential network, stratified by edge type. So we have within mRNA edges, within protein edges, within phosphocyte edges, and the connecting edges between the three layers. Metabolite's not in here. And what we see is here the, the differential integrated interaction score, and here would be the weights if you, we wouldn't do this local denoising. And one particularity is if we wouldn't do this denoising, all edges that stem from prior information would be the same between the two subgroups, so that the difference would be simply zero. And this is how, what we address also by this denoising. So we stretch these values here that would be not informative, identical between the two subgroups to be spread here like the blue dots over different values as being really differential. Okay, how do we derive now differential drug response? So if we have this differential network, what we do is we, for a drug, if we want to predict the response for a drug, we determine its drug targets from databases, DGIDB or drug bank. Then we identify the drug targets within our network and check how the vicinity and close vicinity of our drug targets, the differential network, is behaving. So we average the weights um, attached to our drug targets in the differential network, and like that, we derive a differential drug response score. And this is the example for our case study for ER negative versus ER positive patients for 275 drugs. And what you see here that many drugs do not score differently. They have a drug response score of zero, which is expected, but some few drugs really score high, like this SB743921, ibutimunit and tamatinib in these cases. Okay, now we have these drug response scores, so a ranking of drugs. What it is worth? Is it what we expect? Is it what we want? Is it performing well? And for that, we uh, compared or we took ground truth data from the cancer therapeutic response portal in cell lines. So first we had patient data, now we used cell lines because, well, you do not have these measurements in patients available. 
and we used only the um, breast cancer cell line, um, cell line measurements for ear positive and ear negative cancer cell lines and compared the sensitivity between those. So this is our ground truth and said, okay, those drugs that are, so each dot would be a drug, so those drugs that have a high differential response would be ranked high. And then we compared this ground truth to our predictions for different thresholds for the ground truth. And this is the performance of Dr. Diamond. So the um, correlation is at 0.2, which is not quite, not so high, but at least it's predictive. And also the predictions are at 0.7 or 0.68. So, and what is particularly good is that here, if you check for the, for the very low false positive rate, so the top ranked drugs are really ranked highly. So you have a steep increase here, so top ranked drugs really um, are good and are also differential in there. And actually, what we did is to compare it to different methods. So first of all, to PageRank. So using the Dr. Diamond network, and instead of using our drug response score, using PageRank to um, um, find the importance of drug targets to a drug, and then use this as a score. And we see that it's a bit less predictive. It's also OK, but it's a bit less predictive. And if we go for differential protein expression of drug targets, which would be the most naive approach, maybe, we see that it's not predictive at all. So, in fact, our method really conveys some um, predictive power. It's still, it's a difficult problem, but it conveys some power. And uh, I didn't bring it to you, but if we do not do the denoising, the predictive power is basically lost of Dr. Diamond. Okay. What is more, Dr. Dr. Diamond is explainable. So you can explain where the drug response is coming from. For example, if we go for a drug, momelotinib, it's from myelofibrosis, it's accepted, and it's also in small lung cancer it's used. It has a drug response score of 0.63 here in our case. Where does the score come from? For that, we can determine the drug targets of momelotinib. Again, it's JAK1 and JAK2, so we ask that pathway. Then what we can do is we check the differential edges for these drug targets in our differential network year negative versus year positive patients. And this is what we see as a histogram here. So we see for YAC2, we have only one edge that is attached to this node, whereas for YAC1, we have many edges. So it's mainly driven by YAC1, the differential response. And what is more, you can even go further into and check the condition-specific network, so the year negative network and the year positive network, to see what the edge scores are. And what you see here is that actually most of the edges of those 50, 60 edges, most of them are scored zero in the ear, ne ear positive network, so they do not exist, they do not have a strong weight, while they have a very strong weight in the ear negative network, um, suggesting that YAC1 would have more strong interactions in the ear negative case than in the ear positive case. And we checked whether this could make sense, and in fact we found that in uh, triple negative breast cancer, which would be ear negative as well, um, CBP beta is regulating the drug signaling pathway, but not for ear positive. And CBP beta is an intrinsically disordered protein that is really, really promiscuous in binding and is modulating a lot of regulations and interactions. So possibly these um, explanations make sense from our perspective. Okay. This is Dr. Diamond. It's an abbreviation, so drug response prediction from differential multiomics data. It's generating integrated molecular net networks for each patient group, computing the differential network and deriving predictions from that. It's available as R package and on CRUN, check it out, and also the paper is online now. It's in the ECCB proceedings. I'd be really happy to if you checked it out and tried it out. And with that, I would like to acknowledge people, especially Paulina, it's in front of her poster. Unfortunately, it was yesterday, so maybe some of you have talked to her. So she, she is the first author also of the paper. And then um, I would like to acknowledge the group around uh, Bernard Renard and Dax, or the crowd, maybe the people, some of you, you met here. So all of these are the people that are here, but there are some more, or a lot more actually, uh, students who help with writing the R package. And the work was started with uh, Francisco Azuache, who is now at Genomics England, used to be at Luxembourg Institute of Health and with Jagat Raya Paxe from Singapore. And thank you so much for your attention. Questions? Okay, I can start maybe. Ah, there's a question. There's a mic just close to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your beautiful talk. Um, so, 
Uh, different uh, omics modalities have different uh, signal to noise uh, ratio properties, right? So you would expect, for example, that uh, transcriptomics data will be more um, noise free uh, of accurate than the proteomics, for example, right? So when calculating uh, correlations, you may find that having high correlations for one uh, omics modality is easier than for another one. So my question is, are you taking that into account somehow in your model? And is that maybe resulting of only one type of edges, like uh, intraomics being uh, driving the scores that you get? Yeah, that's possible. So actually, for the densities that we use right now, the intraomic layers, the intraomic edges are dominant. That's true. That's for sure. And yes, it's true that for different modalities, you have different um, weights. And no, we haven't weighted them yet, but this is a very interesting extension we are thinking about already, so this is, this is quite relevant. What I didn't say, and, and you're absolutely right, so I mentioned the metabolomics layer, for example, and we found that it didn't improve our prediction. So, And what we also did is to, to check out um, which layers are most important. And there, a bit counterintuitive maybe to, to what you said, proteomics and phosphoproteomics seem to be most important for the predictions. And transcriptomics rather conveying a little bit robustness to for how many drugs you can make predictions. But overall, for example, only based on, on, on transcriptomics, the predictions were really not so good. So quite yes. interesting. But yeah, weighting is, is something that we have to look into. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I do have a question on your comparison with PageRank. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you apply PageRank on the same network with the, no the weights on the edges? Yes. So you compare like a diffusion model with just taking one hop and, and summing the weights around your, your targets? Can you repeat a diffusion model? Yeah, the PageRank model. Yes. As compared to just taking the weights. So it means that the information is just one hop? Yeah. Ex exactly. So what I didn't do for PageRank, we didn't do this denoising because this is unfair because this is a key, key thing of Dr. Diamond. So we used it on the just weighted differential networks and not with the integrated interaction scores for all of them. So this denoising step is missing. And, yeah. and do you think it could improve uh, again or it would improve more uh, Dr. Diamond to, to use this PageRank with the full mm -hmm. model instead of computing the edge weight? Yes, this might be something. The only issue is what we do right now in order to reduce the computational um, costs, let's say, we only compute this denoising for the relevant edges. So for those close to the drug targets in order to reduce computation. But in principle, the package can also compute it for all. And in principle, we could implement that. Yeah, might be that it's, that it's improving. Yes, you're right. Other questions? No? Okay, so if not, we will thank you again. Thank you. And our last talk will be on graph neural network by Bastian Pfeiffer. Uh, hello. Um, so yeah, I will talk about uh, essentially a Python package we have developed, uh, Gen and Subnet for. Oh yeah, I need to stand here, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, for disease subnet uh, network detection with explainable graph neural networks, and uh, we in our group at the Medical University of Graz are mainly uh, studying and developing methods uh, for the classification of cancer patients into subtypes. And one project of that is uh, the one I present now, uh, detecting patient-specific disease gene models. And one problem when uh, applying um, mach traditional machine learnings on, on uh, tabular data where, uh, where there are some features about gene expression or protein data is that they uh, usually do not take into account the, the fact that genes might uh, function uh, uh, not independently, so there are some connections between these genes. And um, with this research, we uh, hope that incorporating knowledge graphs such as PPI networks into the machine learning pipeline 
will um, give us more robust uh, and uh, especially biological more interpretable results. So the approach is as follows. Um, each patient is represented by um, the topology of a protein-protein network where patients uh, are reflected by the nodes and, um, and the edges indicate functional relationship between these proteins. And um, these nodes are, can be enriched by uh, basically everything which is connected to this specific node or gene which might be uh, gene expression or DNA methylation data. Then we perform graph, class uh, graph classification with graph neural networks uh, in order to classify into a cancer-specific group or a randomized group where we uh, randomly sample across uh, cancer types. And um, in order to uh, uncover the decisions the, the GNN classifier has made, we um, modify a um, very popular uh, GNN explainer um, uh, by optimizing a model-wide node feature mask. So the aim is here to, to um, due to the explanations, so uncovering the decision paths of the GNN, that these regions might be potentially um, potential disease subnetworks. Um, yeah, we assign these obtained um, relevance scores on a PPI network, and then finally apply com uh, whited community detection to detect these disease subnetworks. And this is uh, just again. Um, an illustration of the approach. So at the very left side, uh, each, each graph is representing a patient. And what I tried here is uh, at uh, each node, you see these colored circles, which are the features assigned to these nodes. And on the left side, uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, four patients. And as can be seen uh, here, Every patient has the same topology, but the features within the nodes can vary across the patients. Then we do graph classification into, a, essentially it's a binary classification into a, a cancer-specific group and a randomized cancer group. And finally, apply a GNN explainer to uncover the decision path. And uh, just a short background to um, graph neural networks. Essentially, it's, it's pretty similar to, to what um, is done on images, but instead of aggregating informations from a, a grid uh, in graph neural networks, it's simply the neighborhood which is aggregated. And usually we have an aggregate function and a combined function. And to now, um, and this is ongoing research, and uh, I mean, every day uh, things are published on archive regarding that, is that the aggregating step uh, still is mainly mean or sum. So there's ongoing work to, uh, to introduce uh, different methods. So, and, um, yeah, and this is obviously a black box model, but there's no reason to panic, kind of. Uh, there are really a lot of methods which are developed for instance, uh, graph Lime, you may know um, the very famous method Lime. It's a surrogate method which, which tries to focus on, 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 uh, on a local, local um, prediction area and fits some more interpretable uh, models to it, like in uh, logistic regression. And here in this talk, we will focus on perturbation methods. So the GNN explainer, which I think was published four years ago and is, is basically the very first published um, method to explain GNN decisions, is, um, uh, tries to uh, maximize the mutual, mutual information between the predicted labels of the GNN uh, classifier and the predicted labels when only considering a subset or a sub-area of, um, of the graph. 
And um, what was also reported in literature and what we also uh, observed in experiments is uh, that the GNN classifier suffers from the fact that it uh, tries to uh, is, uh, tries to explain each graph independently, and thus the consequence is uh, that it may overfit uh, the ex explanations. Um, and what we here aimed for was more like a uh, traditional feature selection approach where we want to have uh, information that's, uh, about the features uh, model-wide. So what we simply did um, is first of all we um, optimize a feature mask and then to, to obtain these model-wide explanations we simply sample uh, from the graphs from the test set on, and optimize a single, a single mask. Uh, we did some experiments on synthetic data. We simulated uh, BioBrasi networks, uh, 100 networks um, comprising 30 nodes. And um, these nodes were generated using, uh, the features of these nodes uh, were generated using a normal distribution with mu, a zero, and a sigma. Then we randomly sampled two nodes uh, for which we assigned um, feature values from uh, normal distribution mu minus one for one half of the graphs, and the other graphs uh, got for the exact same nodes um, feature values from a normal distribution with mu one. And uh, yeah, then we uh, evaluated whether the GNX or our modified uh, GNN explainer can successfully detect uh, these two nodes. Here on the left, these are the results on the synthetic data sets. On the left, you see this Barabasi network. And uh, luckily, we can uh, just show one topology, right? So every patient has, uh, has the same uh, topology, and here we selected uh, the edge between five and four as the crucial node. Um, consecutively, we increase sigma, and then report. I repeat this. We repeat this also um, with uh, different topologies. So we we did some iterations, and in each iteration, uh, we generated a, a gener generated a new topology and a newly assigned. Uh, newly selected nodes. And what we can see that uh, the GNN explainer quite accurately detects uh, the edge. And when we increase uh, the noise, then um, as expected, uh, the detection rate gets lower. Uh, here's just some results. Uh, uh, so what we see is that um, our model-wide gene and explainer is more accurate than the original instance-level gene and explainer. So before we go to the application, we had really some problems to um, to find a baseline. So most of, so at least uh, what I'm aware of, most of the base, um, most of the disease model detection methods are kind of unsupervised, or they are trying to infer uh, communities within the correlated uh, communities within the network. And so we started to develop uh, in parallel the, um, this DFNet method, which essentially does the same, but with random forest. And what it did, uh, what it does, it, it, it is, uh, selects one node and starts a random work within a node and from these captured features a decision uh, tree is built. This is um, done multiple times so we end up with a decision tree um, uh, where, where, the, where uh, the features within the decision tree are neighboring nodes in the not network and then uh, we let these decision trees uh, evolve according to their performance and try to minimize, the, uh, reduce the size of each decision tree. But more you can see, uh, read, read up in this archive paper. So we saw that um, 
Gene and subnet, our method, and DFNet, uh, both methods which incorporate the uh, knowledge about uh, protein protein interactions, perform quite similar to neural networks and random forests, which do not uh, take into account any interactions between the genes. So, this is just an example. What you get uh, when executing the pipeline, uh, you have uh, these uh, modules ranked by their model importance. This is an example for kidney cancer. They're yeah, right. And in terms of feature selection, so when you we detected, for example, this, this model, and then we checked the accuracy and also validated. Uh, the enrichment uh, score, the same, three minutes, yeah. Um, yeah, and just as a proof of concept, we, what we did is, okay, what, what are uh, the pairwise distances between these genes? And, not, uh, and this uh, is not surprising, that um, the genes are very near within the network, and yeah, and for neural networks and random forest, forest X expected, uh, they are pretty free to pick any, any gene or any feature. Um, summary and outlook. Disease, um, we presented disease model detection with explainable GNNs. Um, yeah, did some experiments on synthetic data and TCJ human cancer data. The package is available on the, this GitHub repository and can be installed uh, via pip install, uh, GNN subnet. Yeah, and uh, as I said, for now, uh, this is a binary classification um, problem. We, we aim to um, expand it to a multi-class classification model and also play around with some um, other GNN architectures and also GNN explainer. That's basically it, yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yes, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, so you, you said that um, you have the same topology on your network for all patients, but then patients have different, uh, different attributes in the nodes. I wonder if you can comment on how this approach would deal with, with missing data or, or actually yeah. where a situation where only a very small subset of, right. of data types is available yeah. for each patient. Does it adapt to that? Right. Uh, we didn't investigate it in uh, too much detail. Uh, this is, of, of course, very crucial because in a biomedical uh, area there are a lot of missing data, right? Uh, we did an experiment and it crashed. So the, the, the GNN architecture we are using right now uh, is not capable of handling missing data. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you are using protein-protein interactions to to uh, build your graphs, um, then how are the graphs different from patients and controls? Or is the, 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 the classifiers only based on the features of the nodes where you map the, the transcriptomics data or other? Like, how right, are the right, right. Uh, basically the classification is just based on the internal mechanism of the uh, uh, graph neural network to aggregate the information, but it, did, uh, it does so on the tra trajectories of the PPI network, you know? So it was uh, just an uh, effort to put some mask knowledge, uh, human knowledge mask on it, so uh, that we ultimately, that the decision it made is kind of more interpretable by the human expert who knows the protein protein interaction network. So you classify the signal on the graph, not right. the graph structure. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the talk. I was wondering if you if you checked um, whether the um, PP, the PPIs themselves really contribute a lot to to the performance. So what yeah, we right. what we have noticed is that when you when you use um, any network with a similar topology, and then you you, you run disease model mining methods on top of that randomized network, often you get uh, you get results which are almost as good as the ones you would get on the real PPI network, right. simply because this graph acts as a regularizer for yeah. your method. And this seems to be enough. So um, this sure. is a yeah. problem we've observed often, also for our yeah. our own tools. Yeah. So I remember. I, I mean, I'm uh, now. I was starting two years ago now with uh, with machine learning and incorporated human knowledge, you know, into the machine learning pipeline. And what I personally observed so far is you do the hope. The over the hope was really maybe we can generalize even more on test data, unseen test data. And what we see is uh, kind of we, we can maintain the performance uh, and the, 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 the good one is the results are more interpretable, you know. When you would uh, use a randomized graph structure, then it would be kind of a mess, you know, to interpret. Uh, right? Other questions? No? So I would like to thank Bastian and all the speakers today. And thank you.